So there is this whole airframe that you keep in service, despite the fact that it is mostly outdated, save for a few features, and you're keeping it in service just because you have a very particular requirement that nobody else has. You would probably replace it with something more modern, but for a reason or another, you can't. And then a war comes along and you realize that these older frames is actually saving your back. Is it the MiG-31, sir? Uh, yes, it's the MiG-31. So recently our friend at Ruzi, a British think tank that works on uh, geostrategic but also military analysis, came out with an important paper about the air war in Ukraine. They had access to Ukrainian Air Force personnel and they came up with an analysis that partially contradicts their assessment at the beginning of the war. What they learned is that the Russians, once the front line sort of stabilized, started flying six to eight caps of uh, two aircraft continuously during the day. They are basically using Su-35S, MiG-31 and Su-30s to fill in. And in particular, the MiG-31 has been reported making heavy use of the new A-37M air-to-air -air missile. So this point was reported with no particular emphasis among other points, but you can imagine my surprise when I learned that the MiG-31 was actually doing something useful in Ukraine. I always thought that the aircraft was a sort of a relic of very little military value and it was relevant just for Russia because they have this very particular requirement. Sure, a fascinating aircraft for its performance, but of little military value outside its main use case. Well, it turned out, as it often happens, that I was wrong. Shortly after the Ruzi report, two interviews on Zvezda TV actually appeared, one with a Su-35 pilot, the other one with a MiG-31 pilot. And in both cases, in the background, there was an R-37M underslung the aircraft. I watched the MiG-31 interview several times, there was some cool B-roll filmed in flight, and the position of the aircraft was geolocated above the Crimean Isthmus. So we had the Russo report, we had the interviews, and as if this wasn't enough, we had some juice. Juice, the mysterious Ukrainian pilot who flies the MiG-29 and sometimes speaks with the press, actually confirmed that Ukrainians have recorded the R-37M raining on them for many months now. Up to six weapons a day. So today I'm on a mission to understand why an aircraft that was last produced 30 years ago... 29, sir. Okay, 29 years ago is turning out to be fundamental for the Russian effort. So where should I start? Well, I suppose I should start from the beginning, and this time with the help of some old-style paper literature. The story of the MiG-31 is fascinating and deserves a video on its own. However, the first relevant point that I came across was something uniquely Russian. Or better, I suppose it could have been Canadian too, but that's just not possible. Uh, don't, don't, don't quote me on this. The development of the MiG-31 started in the late 60s, obviously as a successor of the MiG-25. The reference opponents were the F-111, the upcoming B-1, and American cruise missiles, and these two were little more than concepts at the time. The aircraft had to operate in the Arctic region where the infrastructures are few and far between. It had to intercept the incoming bombers and cruise missiles above the North Pole, potentially thousands of targets, and keep them off the Soviet territory. And it had to do this with very little help because there was no help available up there. In the words of one of the designers, the aircraft was thought as a S-300 flying battery capable of relocating itself at Mach 2. 
So the result was an aircraft with the same general configuration of the MiG-25, but bigger, flying higher, for a longer time, farther, but not faster, and much, much better and more modern in every other aspect. The Zaslon weapon system was revolutionary at the time. In fact, the MiG-31 was the first fighter featuring an antenna array, uh, actually a PISA radar. And the radar in itself is almost unique because it works in X-band like many other fighter radars, but is also big enough to work in the L-band at lower frequency, which means lower frequency, longer range. The radar tracks can be shared with other MiG-31s through a data link, but can also be handed off to other less capable fighters operating in the area. So it was actually the first fighter capable of operating as a quarterback for a group of less capable aircraft operating nearby, a concept that today is pretty common, particularly in the West, but at the time was revolutionary. The R-33 missile that was developed specifically for the MiG-31, despite not having an active seeker, it had a data link for mid-course guidance, and one aircraft could guide the missiles launched by other aircraft, and the deconfliction was automatic. Sir, you have just crossed the red line, sir. Now, as Otis is saying, I know that a vocal minority of my viewers are reacting in one or two possible ways. Some will say that I'm paid by the Kremlin to spread Russian propaganda. Some others will be saying that I'm either lying, exaggerating, or being utterly incompetent. In both cases, this minority will take the information we have just discussed as a personal or a national offense. Well, I have to say, I am very sorry of having caused you some emotional damage. You should probably consider not watching me anymore, for your own good. Because I will keep reporting what I find in my research, and I have reason to believe it is true and accurate. And since NATO aircraft are already well known, a sizable portion of the channel will always be about Russian, Chinese, or other countries' aircraft. If this offends you, Please do a favor to yourself and stay away from such a harmful content. Okay, now we know how the aircraft came to be. And in this context, it is not surprising that it has the size of a 737, the radar cross section on an oil tanker, but it also has features that nobody else has. It is as fast as the taxman when you forget a comma in your tax return, and it features a radar that can cook rabbits in their holes. And this thing may have its applications, to be honest. The other part of the equation is the R-37M missile. So apparently in the mid-80s, soon after the MiG-31 entered service, a successor for the R-33 was considered, but the program was one of the many victims of the fall of the Soviet Union. It was picked up again in the late 2000s, deeply modernized, given an active seeker, and it entered service in 2018. It is a two-stage weapon optimized for long-range engagement, and it is bloody fast. The top speed, usually reached at the beginning of the flight, may vary between Mach 5 and Mach 7 depending on the launch parameters. The max range is about 400 km, which honestly is outrageous. The practical range against a maneuvering target should be no more than 150 to 200 km. And the MiG-31 has a radar then can actually detect and designate a non-stealth target at those distances. So it's easy to understand why it was the ideal platform for such a weapon. To be fair, the Airbus radar on the Su-35 is not much less potent than the Zaslon, and it is way more sophisticated. But the aircraft is much more versatile than the MiG-31, so it can effectively use the lighter R-77. In the recent months, I'm recording this in January 2023, a slow but steady stream of Ukrainian losses have been attributed to the R-37M, mostly launched 
by MiG-31s. So long range, high altitude, high speed, long endurance. This seems to be the keys to the effectiveness of the MiG-31 slash R-37 couple. But there is still something unclear to me. How exactly this combination is being effective? That is, exactly what are the Russian doing? Most of the available literature is lacking details, so I tried to work out this point myself. The first consideration is that ground-based air defenses are denying to both opponents the airspace above uh, the opponent's territory. When they are close to the front line, both sides are sort of forced to operate very close to the ground to avoid the air defenses. The Russian Air Force probably had more freedom in some cases than the Ukrainians, but overall the situation is symmetrical. But the symmetry stops here. In fact, the Russians fly high altitude MiG-31 combat air patrols on their side of the front line at a safe distance, and the MiG-31 radar was designed to intercepting low-flying targets. That is, is ideal in this situation. Exactly where the Ukrainians are flying. What I suspect is happening is that when the engagement is authorized, one of the aircraft sprints at high speed toward the front line, fires the missiles and then banks away and comes back, and the other aircraft that remained a bit more distant guides the missile toward the target. And all of this is happening from a safe distance, well above 100 kilometers. And since the range is very long, if the target aircraft is aware of what is happening, it can kinematically defeat the missile many times, most of the times, because they end up having quite a lot of time and space to do so. For an AWACS or a tanker, it would probably be much more difficult, but a combat aircraft should be, in general, capable with an adequate notice to avoid the missile. But this is not as bad as it seems for the Russians, because this is what is usually called a mission kill, in the sense the aircraft managed to escape, but the mission has aborted. Why the Ukrainians don't fire back? Well, usually you are told that the R-27 missiles that are used by the Ukrainians are old and inadequate. But that's really not a good explanation, I believe. So the situation across the front line looks like this, but it is better seen like this, from the side. The capability of an air-to-air -air missile of intercepting a target depends on how much energy it has available. If the energy is high, the missile can adjust and follow the target. If the energy is low, it won't, and it will be defeated. This subject is quite complex and I won't get in all the details right now, but let's have a look at the situation. So the total energy of a missile at launch is the sum of the kinetic energy, the, pot the gravital potential energy, and the energy stored in the engine. An R-37 being launched has a kinetic energy that is basically determined by its mass and the speed of the launching aircraft, and the potential energy that is determined by its mass again and the altitude of the aircraft. Then the rocket motor ignites and it will turn chemical energy into kinetic energy. Basically, it means that the missile is going to accelerate. At high altitude, the air density is lower, so the missile will experience a lower drag than down below while accelerating. And it all will also be capable of turning its potential energy into kinetic energy while falling from the sky as an additional bonus. An R-37 being launched at low altitude, in dense air, at subsonic speed, will have to climb toward the target. So the effectiveness of the conversion of the chemical 
energy of the engine into kinetic energy won't be that great. And yes, the R27 is not that great kinematically speaking if compared with more modern weapons. There are several other considerations that we can do, but the key point is that the R37 is launched in the best possible conditions, while the R27 is launched in the worst possible conditions. And there is no direct countermeasure, so if the Russians don't make a mistake or don't have an accident, they will be ahead all the time. It is even difficult to introduce specific tactics because the MiG-31s can always turn around and run away faster than anything the Ukrainian can throw at them. In my opinion, there are just two ways of fixing this situation for the Ukrainians. With electronic warfare effective enough to completely render the Zaslon system useless, or introducing a new aircraft or a new missile. The majority of analysts agree that the ideal aircraft for the Ukrainian would be the Gripen equipped with the Meteor. The Gripen has a very effective radar and the Meteor kinematically is in the same ballpark as the R-37, roughly. But this is probably an entirely different video. And there you have it. In a conflict where strategic errors and tactical blunders abound, um, particularly on the Russian side, well, it seems that this time they did something right. An old system is proving itself to be useful and effective in a rather unexpected way. So, thank you very much for getting so far in the video, and a very special thanks to all those who are supporting the channel either by one-off donations, on PayPal, on Patreon, or by being a member. I will never thank you enough, you are essential, you are one of the main reasons why I keep going. If you want to support the channel, you can also buy a model from Air Models, there is an affiliate link below, I will get a small percentage at no extra cost for you. So if you're not subscribed yet, please subscribe, that is helping a lot, and if you like this video, please leave a like, that's helping as well. Thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.